So I come to the third segment, which is the palace letters invention. You may wonder why the Republicans are so, were so het up about the palace letters. Anybody reading uh, the work of uh, Sir John Kerr knew, and anybody knowing him, as John Paul, who comes occasionally to our functions, anybody knowing him knew that what he wanted was that his letters to Buckingham Palace and their replies be read at some time. He's willing, of course, that they be suspended for a decent period, as is the practice. There was a dispute over whether they should be released quicker than uh, the palace and uh, the National Archives had worked out. And as you know, the High Court decided, notwithstanding its busy program, notwithstanding the fact that the case had been through, uh, I think, about three or four judges in the federal court, they'd all found that uh, there was no need, no legal need to publish the palace letters. They decided to go ahead and order that the letters be published. Now, there's a lady, a Jenny Hocking, who argues, she argues strongly, that there is something in the palace letters which implicates the Queen, which shows that the Queen and Buckingham Palace were closely involved in the sacking of John Kerr. She strongly believed that. She even, she even saw that there was in the appointments book of uh, Sir John Kerr before, uh, before he dismissed Gough Whitlam a few days before. He met somebody from the Foreign Office, the Foreign and Commonwealth Office. There was no, no, uh, no notification about what they were talking about. It seemed to be just a courtesy visit. And Jenny Hocking decided that was obviously to get more instructions from Buckingham Palace on to, uh, on to when to sack Gough Whitlam, which is absolutely ridiculous. Well, in any way, as you know, the letters have been published and it's become very clear, if you look at the letters, that Sir John Kerr, when he wrote to the palace to announce what he'd done to Gough Whitlam, said, I decided to take the step I took without informing the palace in advance because the responsibility is mine and I was of the opinion that it was better for Her Majesty not to know in advance. Though, of course, it is my duty to tell her immediately. His reasoning was all the power was vested in the Governor-General under the Constitution. It would be wrong to tell, tell the Queen in advance because she would then be involved. Anyway, she's built up this conspiracy theory of grotesque proportions. And she, she points to one of the letters where Sir Martin uh, Charteris of the palace says, the fact is that you have the powers as is well known. And she says, this is an indication. The fact that Charteris recognises that he has these powers is an indication that the palace is involved. This is ridiculous. Everybody knows that the Governor General has reserved powers. In fact, Labour's Dr Evatt in the 30s or the 20s wrote a book about them, The King and His Dominion Governors. It was a book dedicated to the question of the exercise of reserve powers, particularly in the dismissal of Jack Lang in New South Wales. In any event, it's very clear that what Sir John did, he did of his own decision and for, not for any instructions or directions from Buckingham Palace. And there's no doubt that Gough Whitlam knew. That there, was a, there was a foolish suggestion in the newspapers that the Governor General should have told Gough Whitlam what he was going to do. Well, the Governor General says in his memoirs they discussed it four times. Gough admits that there, were, there was one time when they did discuss it. That was the visit of Tunku Abdul Rahman, the Malaysian Prime Minister, to uh, Canberra, where, where uh, Tunku Abdul Rahman asked, well, what's happening? What will happen with uh, the dispute going on over the, the holding of supply? And uh, Goff said, he says jokingly, well, it all depends on who gets to the palace first. Goff Whitlam knew exactly what's happening. In, for example, in 1970, in 1970, when the Labour Party was trying to reject supply against the Liberal Party and had so moved in the Senate 
Gough Whitlam said this, the Labour Party believes that the crisis, which would be caused by a rejection of the Prime Minister to follow what the Senate had done, should lead to a long-term solution. He said that uh, everybody knows that if supply is withheld in the Senate, the Prime Minister must resign or, or recommend an election and go to the people. There has to be an election. And Gough was so sure that the consequences of the Senate rejecting supply was that there would be an election, he was so sure of this, that he had Lionel Murphy, the Shadow Attorney General, table in the Senate a list of occasions when Labour had tried to get the supply rejected by the Senate. The only reason supply wasn't rejected by the Senate was because the Democratic Labour Party always refused to join up with the Labour Party in rejecting supply. In any event, Lionel Murphy filed, tabled a list of times the Labour Party tried to reject supply in the Senate. There were 169 occasions and this was the 170th occasion. All we can say about this is that uh, uh, Labour tried 170 times to reject supply and it didn't work. The coalition twi tr tried twice and it worked on both occasions because it resulted in supply being rejected in the Senate and in uh, an election following. There are now two books on the palace letters, one by, one by Paul Murphy and Troy Bramston of The Australian. It has a foreword by Paul Keating. Paul Keating says, Paul Keating says the Queen was not implicated. Paul Keating is very much, he was a minister at the time. He remembers walking back to Parliament and Gough passed him and said, you're sacked. And he wondered what he'd done. What Gough Whitlam was referring was to the fact that uh, Sir John Kerr had sacked him. But Paul Keating, of course, objected to, and objects now to what Kerr did, says in his foreword, it is ridiculous for the Republicans to try and implicate the Queen. There's another book that appeared by Jenny Hocking, and you won't be surprised who's written the foreword. It's Malcolm Turnbull. And Malcolm Turnbull says the Queen was implicated but gives no reason for this, for which he's been scathingly criticised in the columns of The Australian.